Hello and welcome to Dialogue. The 2024 Shangri-La Dialogue is taking place in Singapore this week, where decision makers from across the Asia Pacific, North America, Europe and the Middle East are gathering to discuss the most pressing regional security issues in the world. What are the most significant challenges to regional security today? And how can we avoid a worsening situation in the South China Sea against a backdrop of U.S. competition with China? Join us for our discussion today from Beijing. I'm Xu Qinduo. Joining me today are Dr. Yan Yan, Director of the Research Center for Oceans Law and Policy at the National Institute for South China Sea Studies. Join Pang, independent political analyst, and Herman Lauro, President, Asian Century Philippines Strategic Studies Institute. Welcome to Dialogue. So, Dr. Yang Yang, I will start with you. Uh, the Chinese Defense Minister Dong Juan is uh, to join the Dialogue, Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore, and of course, he's also paying a visit to the country. So, what's the highlights? What's to expect uh, from the Chinese perspective? Well, it is reported that the Chinese Defense Minister Dong Jun will deliver a speech on China's global security concept, and he will uh, meet delegation leaders from uh, different countries. I think the purpose of Chinese delegation to participate this year's Shangri-La Dialogue is twofold. On the one hand, China will reaffirm our commitment to pursuing a path of uh, peaceful development and China's willingness to deepen international military cooperation. And also, on the other hand, there are many accusations recently, especially from the Western world against China over the Taiwan question and also the South China Sea and many things are happening in the Asia Pacific region. So I think taking this opportunity, China can express our um, stance and our explain our policy regarding all these issues to the whole world. Uh, we're joined, you know, uh, seems like there's a, a pattern, you know, like accusations against China or, you know, to the lesser term, like a misunderstanding or lack of understanding of the Chinese policy, of the Chinese action. And one, uh, another, I would say, outstanding question uh, probably would be the Taiwan uh, question. Uh, we know there is a new leader, and uh, because of his uh, you know, pro-independence uh, or his uh, speech, for example, you know, mentions basically the two status, uh, you know, status uh, that that is independence of Taiwan. You know, basically, he's uh, calling for that or uh, de declaring that. So that triggered uh, a sort of a military crisis. So that will also be. Uh, let's say one of the principal topics probably at the uh, dialogue um of course that's going to be uh, one of the uh, topics at the um, dialogue along with these long-standing uh, sort of um, uh, the south china sea issues but it's important to see to stand back a bit and see how um, these things keep coming up um, and in a way you can see that these are uh, incidents uh, that are uh, almost manufactured uh, for the for the occasion, and we're seeing a kind of uh, a gradual kind of uh, um, e increase in in the number of these uh, provocative um, uh, statements and and actions. So um, th that and and giving uh, President Marcos the uh, uh, making him sort of the keynote for this is of course as as my colleague just said um, a um, a way to to. To, to ground the issue. And I think he's going to say uh, President Marcos is supposed to uphold the uh, rules-based uh, international order, a, a concept that's uh, in uh, great disrepute right now. And I, you know, you see that uh, the West is, is really searching for a, an ideology or a reason uh, for these actions, uh, one after another. So you saw even in the uh, Financial Times recently, um, the uh, recommendation that, well, you know, we, let's let's give up on the rules-based order because uh, there's no way we can be consistent on this anyway with what's going on in, in, in Gaza, for example. So um, it, it's really a kind of, um, you know, structured and manufactured uh, situation for, for conflict and, and, and division. So the Shangri-La dialogue occurs in that context and the discussions are set in that context. It's important to stand back and, and see that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yes, uh, to observe closely. Uh, so, Yan Yan, we earlier mentioned the Taiwan question. Of course, this is uh, one of the uh, critical issues, basically, in terms of uh, China-U.S. relationship. Uh, it's also against the backdrop uh, of uh, you know, increasing U.S. competition or U.S. efforts to contain 
uh, the rise of China. Uh, some people would say, you know, Taiwan question uh, is in the way uh, being weaponized against China by Washington. What do you make of it? Well, um, if I recall uh, clearly, in this uh, this April last just la last month, uh, the U.S. Defense Minister Austin just had a, a, a phone call with the Chinese Defense Minister over many issues, and Taiwan uh, question is just one of them. I think to China, the Taiwan is at the core of China's core interest, and we won't. Uh, there will, won't be any compromise. So this is for clear. And also um, during the phone call between the two defense ministers of uh, China and the United States, I think Dong Jun make it very clear that the PLA won't never give in to all uh, separatist activities for Taiwan independence. And I think that is a, a clear message to the United States and also to the whole world. Mm -hmm. uh, well, John, you know, back to you here, of course, you know, when it comes to Taiwan question, people in the West, uh, in particular Western governments, they uh, sometimes, you know, uh, compare that to the situation in Ukraine. Uh, but of course, you know, for the Chinese side, we understand that, uh, very well, it's, it's different because Taiwan is a province of China, but uh, Ukraine is an independent country. Uh, but anyway, uh, some people would say they are trying to make it like, uh, you know, or to launch a, a proxy war or another proxy war uh, against another country. Uh, this time around, maybe in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, well, you know, is there any possibility? You know, does that uh, sound reasonable? This is absolutely crazy. It's, of course, uh, unreasonable and impracticable. Um, but this is not to say that people are not advocating it. So we're in a very strange time. Um, so you have in, in, in the Ukraine situation, escalation towards what could become uh, a direct war with Russia, which would go nuclear. And then, of course, in, in the Middle East, we have a situation described by many observers as, as genocide um, supported by the West and something which alienates uh, the rest of the world and puts completely discredits any notion of a rules-based international order. And then in the middle of all this, uh, these provocations over Taiwan. So these are so crazy, so unhinged, so delusional, um, that you need a, almost a pathology of the West to understand what's going on now. In the middle of this, of course, we have these um, very polite and, you know, well-structured um, types of, of situation like the uh, Shangri-La dialogues every year, and we come along and discuss these issues. But it's important to, to stand back and not be led by the uh, escalatory, uh, you know, ladder uh, you know, that... You know, these issues, for example, over the South China Sea, over Taiwan uh, region, these are very well established. The facts about these are clear, and yet they continue to be played out. So I think what the rest of the world, in particular Southeast Asia, which I, um, I, I'm in Kuala Lumpur right now, and, and which I've observed for a very long time, um, the, the stance to take is to stand back, to realize that we are in a deep system crisis. Uh, of the West and of the Western-led order, and to understand that many of these issues are a result of an old order breaking up, um, and time is on our side. The thing is to uh, not to be rushed into, not to be escalated into uh, conflict, uh, into a totally insane, world-destroying, world-destroying conflict, um, while we wait for while a new order is coming to be. So I think that's that's the right attitude towards these things because, you know, we've gone over and over again, these issues over Taiwan uh, region, uh, over the South China Sea uh, islands, the facts are, are very clear and even where there's disagreement, there is a pr peaceful process for the countries of the region to resolve it among themselves. So, um, you know, we, we simply need to wait for a moment when, when this, is, this is possible. Mm -hmm. But I, I think to be led by nose uh, with one sort of provocation after another um, is, is not the smartest thing right now. Yeah, speak of uh, playing up the issue. Uh, so, um, you know, Laura here, if you look at these disputes between uh, China and the Philippines, for example, uh, in the previous, let's say, the six years time during the president, uh, uh, Duterte's time, 
China and the Philippines handled each other, handled the disputes very well. You know, we had a peace, we had calm, we had cooperation, mm -hmm. we had uh, a rather strong relationship. But the, you know, all of a sudden, we had a new administration in the Philippines, and then we had a, this uh, worsening situation in terms of the disputes. So what happened? Well, in the uh, time of President Duterte, the independent foreign policy allowed him to manage uh, freely uh, what uh, the uh, situation of the Philippines demanded from the uh, relationship with China, which is cooperation. And it was uh, certainly a big boon for the Philippines economically and politically. We got uh, bridges, irrigation systems. Uh, giant, uh, gigantic uh, water supply uh, project, uh, flood control projects, and so on. So this carried on to the first year, at least the first six months of uh, President Bongbong Marcos's term. But suddenly in February of uh, 2023, after a very successful and laudable uh, visit uh, to China with a grand welcome from President Xi Jinping on February of 2023, uh, President Bongbong Marcos suddenly, uh, without explanation, without rational uh, uh, presentation of reasons, uh, pivoted to America. Many people suspect, of course, that uh, some corruption uh, opportunities are, are behind it, as well as probably threats from the United States. Uh, so this has been tragic for the Philippines. Uh, the In 2024, the first quarter of 2024, investments... Uh, crashed by 62 to 63 percent and uh, certainly the relationship with China is one of the problems affecting this. Uh, we have an association for Philippine-China understanding and some members have already uh, reported that uh, their credit lines from Chinese suppliers have been suspended uh, or is in jeopardy because of fears of uh, both sides uh, of, uh, particularly at the supplier side of probable uh, problems from the tensions with the Philippines and China, between the Philippines and China. So this is already negatively affecting the Philippines. And it is not only the Philippines that can, or Filipinos that see this, our ASEAN neighbors uh, are also observing this. For example, the Singaporean prime, uh, foreign minister visiting Manila and talking to our uh, his counterpart, uh, the uh, foreign secretary Manalo, mentioned that um, uh, the tensions in the South China Sea are already affecting negatively the economic and trade conditions of the region. Uh, so this has been really very uh, a very big setback for the Philippines. Uh, of course, internally in the Philippines, the nation is getting divided. Even the family of the president is divided. Uh, he is allowing the Americans to run roughshod over the country with its military bases, with its military drills, while uh, the president's sister, uh, Senator Amy Marcos, has been uh, playing a devil's advocate and uh, resisting these overtures from the United States. And just recently, just a week ago, uh, the presidential mother, uh, uh, 94 years old, uh, Imelda Marcos visited the opening of the new chancery of the Chinese embassy in a very public uh, event, mm -hmm. uh, showing her desire to resolve uh, the tensions with China peacefully and uh, cooperatively. So the nation is divided, the presidential family is divided, and of course the pop population is also divided uh, on these issues. So. Mm -hmm. So nothing good is coming out of this for the Philippines. Mr. Hermat Laura, you know, like, do you think the, the Philippines or the public or the government, uh, you know, understand that, uh, of course, we, we mentioned earlier, like there's a background. The background is like a U.S. is, uh, uh, you know, fiercely com competing with China in their own term or to contain China. You know, Taiwan could be a weapon against China. Of course, you know, in that sense, you know, people would say the, Fili the Philippines could be a weapon against China. Do you think people understand that? You know, people think that's, uh, you know, a possible or that's, uh, you know, uh, probably what's going on? If I could recall correctly, at least 80% of the Filipino people in several surveys that have been done from 2023 uh, has expressed fears that the tensions with China may result in war. And this is not something they uh, desire. 
Uh, so it is indeed uh, rejected by the Filipino people. However, the massive uh, control of the American influence media owned by the Philippine oligarchy, which are uh, which is connected with the uh, American financial uh, cabal, uh, has such massive influence that they can sway public opinion. But the educated class, the thinking class, the objective um, intellectual class, I think, uh, can appreciate the danger to the Philippines and the negative impact of this situation. And uh, mm -hmm. I think... Uh, the president himself realizes this, uh, and in fact, uh, in November 2023, at the sidelines of the San Francisco APEC conference, uh, President Bongbong Marcos took the initiative to uh, have a discussion with uh, President Xi Jinping on the aisles of the halls of the APEC conference and proposed easing of tensions. And this process uh, continued for the next two, three months until January when an officer of the Western Command of the Philippines in charge of the deliveries of food and other materials to the controversial BRP Sierra Madre, the derelict ship in the Renai Chiao or uh, Ayungin Shoal, mm -hmm. operationalized in his own words, uh, the admiral's own words, operationalized the instruction of the president to help ease the tension in the uh, South China Sea. But uh, two months later, three months later, he was sacked by forces within the administration uh, whom we suspect were maneuvered by the Americans to do this. And uh, President Bongbong Marcos has just so far kept quiet. And this is the dilemma. I think even the president knows the crisis we're in because of these uh, pressures from the Americans creating these tensions. Uh, and I also have to mention that the in February 2023, uh, when uh, President Ma Bongbong Marcos uh, pivoted to the uh, United States of America again, uh, there was a Project Mushu that the Americans pushed on the Philippine government. Uh, Project Mushu is the name. And uh, it is a propaganda operation, operationalized by a faction in the Philippine Coast Guard and the Philippine military, uh, provoking China to uh, to respond to the such... Uh, water cannon me we call it in the philippines uh, allowing the uh, provoking china the chinese coast guard to water cannon our ships and boats in order for the inter inter international media to cover this and report it all over the world and uh, proclaim uh, china as the bully and uh, the uh, philippines as the victim mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the expressed objective of this project Mushu is to exact a reputational damage on china so we can see yeah. uh, but uh, anyway uh we're now in 2024 and uh well, things have uh, uh taken a turn for the worse yeah well it, that's uh, speak of this um, propaganda operation uh, john I, I think a lot of people if they are a keen observer of what's uh, you know washington operation for example there's a at one point you know the congress uh, appropriated uh, a certain amount of money, like a, a few billions. 500 basically. million. Yeah, for the NGOs, million. for the media, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to yeah. yes. basically yes. to pick up right. if they're, you know, to basically to tarnish the image of BRI. And now I guess it's targeting That's China. Right. No, as I said, as, as we're here to discuss the, uh, the Shangri-La dialogue, I wanted to try to contextualize it. Um, it's been a useful uh, dialogue. Um, it's organized by a British um, think tank, uh, but uh, hosted uh, very capably by Singapore over the years. I think 21 of them, uh, if I'm not mistaken, have been held. Um, it's, it's been a useful mechanism, but it's showing its age. It's um, really the set of assumptions that it that it's it's that they come with it um are from are, are part of the problem um they're part of this uh system this uh this system crisis that i'm talking about a hierarchy uh, a western dominated hierarchy of several hundred years uh in search now of a uh, of a justification while all the justifications have, have sort of collapsed one by one 
So it's an increasingly brutal uh, and mask off type of coercion so that uh, discussions like this become more and more empty. You're talking about rules-based order, people will laugh at you. Uh, well, maybe this is the order, this is uh, the West is about defending freedom and people will laugh at you too. So <laughs> what's needed in the region uh, so that we're not led by the nose uh, discursively, right, and conceptually uh, by, this, uh, by, by this old order. What's needed are our own fora, our own ways of discussing things. And in this regard, there is the Beijing Xiangshan uh, Forum, Forum. Uh, which has begun, that's right, and it's, it's uh, you know, that, that's an important one. There are other ones in the region, such as next week in Kuala Lumpur, there's the Asia Pacific Round Table. But the more and more people need to uh, set up their own to discuss this in their own terms, rather than answering one after another, the really rather stupid, really silly um, types of, uh, you know, uh, objection that come up and just the naked propaganda. They're just so ignorant, for example, of the facts um, that it's just tiresome to keep having to refute them. I mean, just a simple example, since we've been discussing the Philippines quite a lot, so it's just been clear from, from our, you know, meticulous archival research uh, done by a scholar at Beijing Institute of Technology recently uh, that, you know, the French and, and British over the last uh, colonial powers in the region absolutely considered the Sisha and Nansha Islands, the Paracel and Spratly Islands as, as, as Chinese. So, and not under the Americans, uh, which at the time uh, ruled the Philippines. So many of these issues are the product of the colonial era and were deliberately left unresolved in the so-called decolonization and incomplete decolonization process. Taiwan is definitely another one of these. The whole issue is very much part of the era of Japanese aggression and imperialism, and it's, and it's, it's, it's disgraceful, it's laughable that, that we now have a situation of Japan coming in and, and claiming to stand for, for Taiwan. <laughs> um, when the, the, this situation is very much a product of, of uh, the Japanese uh, annexation of, mm -hmm. of Taiwan. And furthermore, that, the, that Japan has agreed in its normalization of relations with China after the war, that this, this is Chinese territory. So we don't want to keep going back to this and to have really vapid, vacuous framing such as rules-based order or freedom, our challenge is to set the agenda in our own terms beyond the, the Shangri-La dialogue. You know, how do you look at that? Uh, you know, I, I understand that in the countries in the, in the region, uh, most of them, if not mm. all of them, uh, you know, for them, the priority mm. is really about uh, development. So we need more trade, more investment in each other, with each other, instead of, uh, you know, like somehow accelerating or uh, you know, raising the tensions or creating more troubles for each other. Um, but, uh, you know, now we have a U.S. factor here. So how, do, how does uh, ASEAN, you know, uh, community look at this issue? Absolutely. Um, ASEAN's priorities are human priorities, uh, development, uh, peace and concord uh, in the region and an openness uh, to all. And in this regard, it has defined for a long time and stands by its uh, so-called ASEAN neutrality. But it's important to understand that, that uh, very important to understand, that neutrality is not simply a triangulation between uh, two sides. What we have here is, a, you know, let's go back to where that neutrality began. It's a kind of commitment to the principles of the non-aligned movement. It was standing, not wishing to be part of the Soviet or the, the US uh, bloc during the Cold War. But now this is a different situation. This is the West versus the rest. And here, um, you know, ASEAN standing up for its own sovereignty is, is truly uh, important. What all that neutrality was about was about preserving its sovereignty and having solidarity with other nations of the global South. So now that's a very big and important issue. Development, as you, as you said, uh, Chin Duo, is is a key thing. It doesn't come into these securitized discussions, uh, beloved of the uh, Anglo-American <laughs> type of, uh, uh, you know, fora. Um, so, the, you know, global, the, the, the link between this, the, the fact that we're recovering, we're still recovering from COVID, that's completely left out of it. So th there's a whole region to develop. And that development is hand in hand with how big, how the most powerful economy in the region and our neighbor, time and forever, China. So, so there's a 
completely an air of unreality about the media and also the type of discussion we, we tend to have about South China Sea and so on, that I think we should just step out of. And, and as I said, back to this issue, we need to be able to define our own issues and conduct and solve these problems on our own. The, um, the Philippines taking this tack is quite frankly, I mean, the, the leaders won't say it, but it's quite frankly a kind of embarrassment for ASEAN. But in, in, in the ASEAN manner, they will wait for this to tide over for good sense to 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 prevail to prevail um, you know china is is our geography right it's it's not just a, a you know today on tomorrow <laughs> issue it's our neighbor mm -hmm. uh, so mr laura of course we say the us is a, a you know a superpower the us is a, is a, let's say has a lot um, you know they are capable of uh, let's say you know making changes or stirring up trouble uh, for certain region for certain country how do you see the, the role uh, being played by the U.S. Uh, in terms of the South China Sea dispute here? Well, uh, the U.S. Uh, is a puppet master. It uses proxies, as we see in Ukraine, as we see in Taiwan, as we see in the Philippines. I don't think the United States wants to confront a peer power uh, like China or as in uh, in uh, the European continent, Russia, it is avoiding direct confrontation with a peer power. Uh, especially today, uh, when uh, this uh, military technology of China is already exceeding in many ways uh, uh, America's uh, military technology, and certainly the will power and the manpower is uh, exceeding the capacity of the U.S. to match China. I think uh, the U.S. will contain, uh, continue to use proxies in its uh, effort to uh, contain China. Uh, well, other proxies like uh, Japan and South Korea, uh, it will continue to contain China with uh, this ring of uh, bases, uh, which uh, the Philippines has allowed to five to be added uh, to the ring of bases around China. Uh, I am still hopeful that uh, the crisis within the United States of America, financial, economic, and social, will overtake uh, the United States' uh, strategic uh, plan to uh, wage proxy wars against China. So on that note, I think uh, I would rather take a positive view, work very hard to uh, reduce, if not eliminate, uh, uh, the United States of America from the geopolitics of the region. I think, uh, again, I'll go back to ASEAN, which has the zone of peace, freedom, and neutrality pact among themselves, and the Southeast Asian Nuclear Free Zone Pact. I think ASEAN should take these more seriously and raise these issues with the Philippines and uh, with uh, each other and with the regional uh, powers such as uh, some powers such as uh, uh, South Korea and Japan, and together uh, new make the region truly neutral and keep out the gunboat diplomacy of the West and the United States of America. Yeah, real diplomacy uh, is necessary. Well, on that note, we yes. come to the end of today's discussion. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.